so our next speaker is um, Dr. Joe Mills. Uh, Dr. Mills is a professor of uh, surgery and now the chief of uh, vascular surgery at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. He and I share uh, a special camaraderie of both training under Dr. John Porter. Uh, and uh, many of you may know, uh, may have known who he was, but uh, that is a special camaraderie amongst all the fellows. Um, Dr. Mills is, uh, uh, was at the University of Arizona for over 20 years, and his uh, expertise really is in lower extremity arterial reconstruction, lower extremity vascular lab research, and uh, diabetes, uh, and treating patients with lower extremity diabetic wound problems. So we are pleased to have Dr. Mills come speak to us about uh, healing the diabetic foot wound as it applies to the vascular surgeon's perspective. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. I, I actually haven't moved yet. I'm moving in June, but it's kind of ex exciting to uh, try something different. So I'm going to give a different talk. It's not actually going to be a lot about wires and gadgetry and bypasses because we've had a lot of those kind of talks already. It's a little bit more philosophy. And so what I want to try to provide for you is a framework for how do you take care of these patients with diabetic uh, foot wounds. So I did, I did want to show that we occasionally have winter in the Sonoran Desert. So this was a couple of years ago. And to see that much snow on the saguaros is kind of a neat experience. I have no conflicts of interest. So um, the first thing is that I think you need to build a team. So I did vascular surgery for a long time, learned to diabetic foot care, lower extremity PAD from Dr. Porter, learned how to do distal bypasses, then adopted endovascular technology. And when you look at diabetic foot problems and PAD and, and critical limb ischemia from a vascular surgeon's perspective, you're really only seeing a small part of what the diabetic foot problem really is. And so we developed in Tucson with David Armstrong this model we called Toe and Flow, which is based on trying to integrate podiatry and vascular surgery together. And, and people have tried to do this before, but we're actually in the same department, same division, same team. We see all consults together, so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then the second thing is sort of a management algorithm. How do you, what's your philosophy for how you evaluate these patients? How do you do patient flow? And then you have to consistently apply your principles or therapy doesn't work. So these patients, the upper one on the left was a small neuroischemic ulcer. I took care of that patient when I was at Wolford Hall. And some of those patients were University of South Florida. Most of them were uh, in Arizona. All those patients kept their limbs except the patient on the bottom of the right. And the point of this slide is when you talk about leg ulcers and foot wounds and diabetic foot ulcers, it's a huge spectrum. So to act like you can have one therapy that works for all these patients, I think, is naive. Um, and then the other thing that struck me after doing this for about 20 years is that when you're a vascular surgeon, again, you're seeing a small part of the iceberg. So you know, we save these legs, we revascularize them, but what, we really take care of the entire problem. So what do we do about prevention? We can identify patients with diabetes that have neuropathy that are at risk for limb loss. Vascular surgeons don't do that. What about routine foot care to prevent ulceration? I can actually if you prevent a foot, foot ulcer. You might be doing a lot more good, like sort of like a vaccine, than waiting until the patient leaks into the emergency room with an infected foot ulcer because they've never had prevention. Do we screen patients for risk? Vascular surgeons don't do that. What if you have patients that are at high risk for recurrence? We don't do so well with that either. We, we revascularize them, we'll do a transmet, we'll do a skin graft, we'll save a difficult foot, we'll monitor their graft. But if they're not offloaded correctly, they get a new foot wound. So I had all these patients that ended up with Aquinas deformities after transmets and they'd get recurrent varicose wounds on their foot. And it wasn't because we didn't want to take care of them, but we didn't have the right mix of people. And then what about doing some prophylactic reconstructive surgery on the foot? in patients with motor neuropathy to try to prevent the ulcer that's going to cause the infection, it's going to lose a limb to begin with. So vascular surgeons do none of that. Total contact cast, most of us don't have experience with that. All these procedures I list here, uh, most vascular surgeons don't do any of that. So I think really to, to link these two together, if you kind of look at what components would, would be required for complete diabetic foot care, you'd want somebody that does screening and prevention, someone that does gait analysis, stratifies risk, screens patients, monitors them, does offloading. Then where vascular surgery fits in is we can assess blood flow, which some of the podiatrists actually 
even though they see so many patients with foot problems, I think they, they're not as tuned into the circulatory part as they could be. And we can revascularize either open or endo. Both groups can do surgical debridement and drainage. And then post-operative monitoring the high-risk foot, we do the vascular part, but actually the, the foot part we don't do so well with. So we tried to integrate both of them. And the thing I like to do is Dr. Armstrong talks a lot. I like to talk a little bit, but I mostly like to work. So even when we're doing footwork, I show this everywhere. He's lecturing and I'm doing the work. That's just a joke. So the, trans, the transmet, anybody can do that. But there's some really high-risk transmets. And this patient actually has a pretty big heel ulcer. And if you don't immobilize them, it's not going to heal. So this is a, what we call a salsa stand, Southern Arizona Limb Salvage Alliance. He kept the patient in this for six weeks and got this chronic heel ulcer and forefoot wound to heal. So that's, that's the teamwork part of my talk. So the next part of the talk is more an algorithm for how do you look at these patients? So what do you look for? And, and I struggled with this for a long time. So when I started with Dr. Porter, my experience in the Air Force had been a large experience with carotids and aortic disease, and not a whole lot with, with infra, infraguinal disease, and certainly not much with infraginiculate disease. And then I did 100, over 100 fempop and tibial bypasses with Dr. Porter, and I kind of got into the mode of all these patients could be revascularized. There's not one case that you can't do. And particularly when you add endo to that, almost everybody that has severe ischemia can be corrected. So it seemed kind of easy. So about 15 years, you know, you got an ischemic wound, you, you've assessed them, you revascularize them, they all heal, right? Well, I noticed that the patients, first of all, they don't heal so quickly. Even if you do that pretty carefully, it's still a flog, like one of Dr. Robinson's cases the other day. We did both open and endo on this patient and finally got a three-year durable result. But it wasn't one easy procedure, it was multiple procedures. Uh, so it started occurring to me that things had changed, that the patients that we were taking care of weren't the same ones that I was treating when I was a resident or Dr. Porter's trainee. So what had changed? <clears throat> so we'll go through this a little bit. So these, the, all these individuals here help with this concept. Uh, and I, I went to Belgium last year, and there's a famous um, artist named Rene Magritte. But the, 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 the whole era of art in that, in that, in that time frame was, was how to look at things differently. And so what got me interested in this whole topic was this overused term critical limb ischemia and critical limb therapy. So why are the results so disparate? Why do some groups do only endovascular therapy and magically all the legs are healed, and other groups do dorsalis pedis bypass grafting and most of the legs healed? Uh, how does that work? And it, so I think it depends on how you look at this group of patients and which patients you include. So why do we need something called Wi-Fi? I'll outline that briefly, but it goes back to this term critical limb ischemia. So it, it's not a very well-defined term. It actually was never intended to be used to patients that have diabetes, and I'll show you that. The, the concepts that vascular surgeons were taught were based on pure ischemia models. So we have the Rutherford model from the U.S. and Fontan from Europe that basically classify a foot wound purely on the basis of blood flow, but they don't talk about how much of a wound you have at all, really, and they don't mention even infection. I'll show you why that's important. So it, it became obvious to me about five to ten years ago that we had these old systems for how we thought about patients and analyzed them, but they didn't really apply to the patients we were seeing. So this paper, how many people have read this paper? So almost everybody here has heard the term critical limb ischemia. I'm sure you've heard that, right? So this was actually the first paper that, that wrote about it. It was 1982, and there's some pretty famous people on there. It's only one page, so I'd urge you to all go read it. And I'll show you why that's important in a minute. So their, their definition, they were trying to decide what kind of patient had such profound ischemia that they were at risk for losing their limb. So these were not acute ischemia patients. These were all chronic ischemia. And these were just experts that had started treating vascular disease. So the first FEMPOP bypass was done in the mid-50s. So this is about 25 years later. So basically they said, look, if you have classic ischemic rest pain and an ankle pressure less than 40, that's an at-risk leg. And unfortunately, they use the term critical limb ischemia, implying that the leg would be lost without therapy, which isn't totally true. And they said, but if you have a wound, you probably could have a slightly higher pressure, but it's still not going to heal. Because once you get that wound, you need more perfusion for wound healing. So the definition was, if you have a wound, like superficial necrosis of the foot, ulcer, or digital gangrene, forefoot, pressure's less than 60, that's probably not going to heal. So we'll call that critical limb ischemia. So that part, that definition has pretty much stayed intact for 30 years. But what they said in this paper, which was really profound, it was generally agreed that diabetic patients have a varied clinical picture of neuropathy, ischemia, and sepsis, make a definition even more difficult, and these patients should be excluded. 
So that term was never intended to be applied to diabetics. So I remember early in my training, you'd see a patient who was a smoker, diminished femoral pulse, absent foot pulse, ABI 0.4, pure rest pain, a dead fourth toe, a cyanotic fifth toe. That's a pure plumbing problem. That's pure ischemia. And those patients often weren't diabetic. Now, in the last two years we reviewed our series, 92% of the patients I've revascularized are diabetic. 92%. Huge shift. And they, they do have a component of ischemia, but their problem isn't all ischemia. So how do you come up with a classification system? So this was the one, Fontan wrote this in German, um, and basically these are used widely in Europe. They're still, urged, uh, still used in uh, classification systems. But this is a pure ischemia model. So stage one means that you have no clinical symptoms, but if you do testing, they have arterial occlusive disease. So this is used as a, as a pe people now, because procedures get paid for, we're supposed to screen people for PAD, presumably so you can do interventions on them. Well, it's not warranted if they're asymptomatic. They need risk factor control. But that was stage one. Stage two means you have claudication, so you don't have any symptoms when you're sitting around doing nothing. But if you walk, you get limb pain, muscular pain. Stage three was pure ischemic rest pain, so pain with depend uh, with uh, elevation relieved by dependency. And then stage four was gangrene, and, and 4A was localized gangrene, and stage B was, was uh, more extensive gangrene. And the word they use, Brandt in German actually, is also a slang word for thirst. But if you kind of look at these patients, this is a pure ischemia model. The, the distal toes and forefoot are so thirsty, they're dry, they're parched, they're like living in the Sonoran Desert for the last 20 years, and they need blood flow, they need irrigation. So that was pretty simple. And, 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 and what was better about Rutherford was they went through the same stages, basically from asymptomatic all the way up to gangrene, but correlating with hemodynamic measurements, those same ones I used, I showed you for the definition of critical limb ischemia. Now what people forget is here. So for years, so stage four is ischemic rest pain, stage five is minor tissue loss, non-healing ulcer, focal gangrene, diffuse pedal ischemia, and these hemodynamic measurements. So what if you have a diabetic with a foot ulcer whose ankle pressure is 70? They're technically not critical limb ischemia, but some of those people probably need to be vascularized. And so a lot of us kind of said, well, if you have a little bit of gangrene at stage five, you have a lot more at stage six. Well, no, the definition actually says, if you have so much tissue loss that that foot's no longer salvageable, that's a stage six. So those are non-salvageable limbs. So basically, all the patients I showed you in that rainbow spectrum of disease are Rutherford five. So that's part of the problem for trying to analyze outcomes. If you lump all those things together, you're going to have widely disparate results depending on the spectrum of patients you're seeing. So these, this was in the SVS article, but these, the, all these patients can be staged in different ways. Um, now, a little philosophy. So I like to put things together. So if you're going to take care of these patients, how do you look at them? So the first thing you need to define is what's the status of the limb? And the thought I had there was we need something like TNM for tumors. So how much disease burden is there in the leg? So the TNM classification system, like for breast cancer, really hasn't changed since I was a resident. But the therapy's changed, and why is that? Because we classified the disease carefully, and then as we analyzed therapy for different stages of disease, we came up with better treatments. So for limb therapy, if we don't have a better staging system, we're always gonna be arguing about endo first, endo second, bypass third, all that stuff is going to be really hard to analyze if we don't have a staging system up front that makes sense. So the purpose of Wi-Fi was to do this. So what Wi-Fi stands for is classify the wound, classify how much ischemia you have, and is there foot infection? I'll show you why that's important. Now, that doesn't, that's not everything you need to have to treat the patient. So once you do that, we're now on this global guidelines group that's trying to replace what TAS did. We're going to try to come up with something that looks at patient comorbidities. And those include um, cardiac comorbidities, pulmonary comorbidities, functional status, things like do you have a vein, because all those things are going to come in once you classify the disease burden and try to come up with a risk of amputation, then you got to look at the patient. So depending on how many comorbidities the patient has, that may profoundly influence your therapy. And then finally, instead of this focus we've had for years on lesion anatomy, like here's the arteriogram, what do you want to do? Well, how much disease is in the leg? and how sick is the patient? I can't answer this question, the anatomy question, until I know those other ones. So that's the framework, is those three things have to be looked at for everybody. So the purpose of the Wi-Fi system, which we actually use in practice, and it's being used pretty widely, I'll show you some data here, 
is how to classify the limb. Now, why is that important? Well, diabetes, uh, Rob talked about obesity. Diabetes is the epidemic of modern times. So there's almost 400 million Americans now with diabetes. It's a huge epidemic. So someone in the world gets diagnosed with diabetes every 17 seconds. About two-thirds to three-quarters of the amputations done in the world that are non-traumatic are from diabetes. So about as often as someone gets diagnosed with diabetes every 20 seconds, somebody in the world loses their leg from diabetes. It's really, really profound if you think about that. And yet, in this era of non-communicable disease, not a lot of people talk about this. It's kind of ignored. So the problem with our systems are we have these pure ischemia models, but we've been trying to apply them to a group of patients for which they were never intended. And then it seems as though diabetes has changed. So earlier in my career, most diabetic foot ulcers seemed to be purely neuropathic and basically needed offloading drainage if they were infected and they healed. Now most of them seem to have some component of ischemia. And the other thing that's really, really important is once that wound gets infected, it alters everything. So if you look at the Eurodial study, big, big study in Europe, and they defined PAD as an ABI less than 0.8. If you had a foot ulcer that got infected and you had PAD, it tripled your amputation risk. And that's just any PAD. That doesn't even talk about severity. So this, this shows you graphically. If you have a foot ulcer with no PAD, assuming you drain the infection, it does okay. If you have PAD, it makes things a little bit worse, but if you get PAD plus infection, it really drives up the amputation risk. So why is that? So here's our philosophy. This is how we work in our clinic. So if you measure perfusion in a foot and you have a diabetic foot ulcer, no matter whether you use ankle pressure, if they're measurable, toe pressure, transcutaneous oxygen, you get this sigmoid curve. So there's patients with a warm foot that have a pure neuropathic ulcer under their, under their metatarsal head bounding foot pulses, no matter how you measure their blood flow, it's fine. They have neuropathic ulcers. They need a podiatrist. Then you have people with three dead toes, no foot pulse, flat toe waveforms, no infection yet. They need revascularization. But then there's a lot of patients somewhere in here that have a little bit of ischemia and a little bit of a wound. What do you do with them? Do you angiogram every single one of them in angioplastium? Well, we don't. So what we do here is if they have a pure neuropathy foot problem, the podiatrist mostly takes care of them. If it's obvious ischemia, we take care of them. And if, if it's somewhere in the middle, we both take care of them until we sort it out. So what's Wi-Fi? I'm just going to run through this real quick and then show you how we use it. So basically, it's, it's classify things simply. There's either none of it, there's a little bit of it, and there's some of it, or there's a lot of it. So mild, moderate, severe. So how do you do that? So for the foot wounds, we basically took PETIS, which was written by Nick Schopper, or the UT classification, which Armstrong and Lavery did. So basically, if you have ischemic breast pain and hemodynamic changes consistent with that, but don't have a wound yet, that's a zero. Minor tissue loss wounds mean that you can take off one or two toes, no more than that. Stage two wounds would require up to a transmet to heal, a standard transmet. And if they have large full thickness heal ulcer, or they might require something proximal to a standard transmit like a Chopar or Liz Frank, that's a class three wound. So those, those kind of correlate with how hard it's going to be to heal the wound. Then you measure ischemia. So there's lots of studies that show if your ABI is over 0.8 or your toe pressure is less than 60, even if you have an SFA stenosis or something, that doesn't have to be fixed to heal. And there's lots of other studies, Oppelquist's work in Europe and the Basel study that pretty much show if your ABI is less than 0.4, toe pressure is less than 30, that wound is more likely to require vascularization. Again, not automatic. What about a real, real frail patient with a tiny foot ulcer and no rest pain? Some of those people we might try to nurse along, get to heal, but that's the most severe category. And then you basically split up the two in between. And then this is the IDSA, Infectious Disease Society of America's classification of infection, which does correlate with risk of amputation. And the good thing about it is it's purely clinical. There's no x-rays in there or anything. It's basically no wound infection versus systemically ill patient. So if you have somebody that steps on a nail and they get gas in their foot and they had palpable foot pulses before they started, and when they come in, they're septic and they have gas up to their knee, they're going to lose their leg even if they have the best vascular surgeon in the world. So that's not even accounted for in our classification systems. So then we took these three things together and we asked a group of people to say, all right, if you use this classification system, what's the risk of amputation if you treat this limb just with medical therapy at a year? And the second question was, how likely do you think they are to benefit from revascularization? So we asked these people to classify the categories into four groups. And basically what you see here 
is even for mild to moderate ischemia, if you get a bigger wound or it gets infected, the amputation risk is really high. And same thing, even for mild and moderate ischemia, as the wound gets bigger, if you had infection you controlled, most people felt the patient would benefit from revascularization. And these patients have ABIs between 0.4 and 0.6, so they're not CLI patients. So how does that pan out in the world? So we made this graph that basically thought the classifications that we came up with based on this Wi-Fi would correlate with risk of amputation. So that was sort of the hypothesis. So the first group that did this, David Cull and Spence Taylor's group, presented this and it's just been published. They used Wi-Fi and they took patients consecutively who'd been revascularized and applied it. <clears throat> and what they came out with was the predicted, the predicted ones, keep in mind, were kind of made up because we didn't have data for it. These were what were predicted by the Wi-Fi classification system. This is what they actually saw in their practice and these correlate with non-healing. So what does this mean? This is patients that have been revascularized. So this shows you that even patients that get revascularized, their outcome is largely dependent on the disease classification up front. So the smaller wounds that aren't infected, amputation risk pretty low, but once you get up to large wounds with, with infection, amputation risk goes way up. Um, this just shows you the odds ratios. This was a paper that hasn't been published yet, but it was presented at the SVS, and this was Mike Conti's group from California. They used Wi-Fi, and they applied it to a consecutive group of patients, and basically they showed the, the big factors that influenced outcome were infection. Now this is our own analysis of, of over 200 patients that we used Wi-Fi. So in stage one, two patients, we had no amputation. Stage three, very small, and the bulk of amputations were all in clinical stage four patients. Now not all these patients were revascularized because some were stage four because of infection, but the point of this is if you use this stratification tool, it tells you up front what the risk of amputation is. This is one year amputation free survival. So even for stage four, it's pretty good. It's over 60%, but it's not 90% like some of these studies that you read. So I think if you don't classify the disease correctly up front, you're not gonna know what your therapy does. Uh, this just shows wound healing time, which basically correlated, even for the people with limb salvage, the more advanced stage patients took longer to heal, even with good therapy. So the system seems to work. Now, this is a really interesting paper which has some history. Uh, Jay showed a paper earlier. So this is uh, Clem Darling's son, who is a pre-med student, I believe, or maybe med student, did this study, and it's gonna come out at the Society of Clinical Vascular Surgery, but they took almost 600 CLI patients that all were treated with endo, used Wi-Fi classification, and each clinical stage increased the risk of amputation. So regardless of therapy, even with good therapy, the amputation risk was determined less by the endovascular therapy, but more by the limb stage. So in conclusion, I think that, that you can use this in practice, because basically when I get a call from the ER, I used to get this call, we have a diabetic foot ulcer. Okay, what does that mean? So what do you really want to know? Where's the wound? How bad a wound is it? Is it infected? And does the patient have altered perfusion? So if you use Wi-Fi, you get all those things immediately, and it lets you prioritize things. So up front, the priority might be more revascularization on certain patients. Well, actually, the initial priority is always control of infection. But assuming you do that, then you have got the infection control. Then the priority shifts over to blood flow or offloading, depending on how much ischemia you had. Um, it's not intended to tell you how to treat the patient, but it's intended to tell you how to think about it. So this was a little old lady I took care of for three years. She had a great daughter that took care of her at home, really frail, probably needed a bypass, but you can see she was already on dialysis obese, very small vein, fat legs, and I got her saved both legs with three endovascular procedures over two years, and I had to redo one of them. So I think for the right patient, endovascular is great, but you gotta take care of the patient. And it's always humbling, as Dr. Robeson's case showed the other day, these patients are really difficult to take care of, and even though you might get a great result for a couple of years, then something else happens, so you haven't really cured them, you've put them in remission. So I think if you stay humble and, and remember that, that you're trying to put these patients in remission for as long as possible, but you're not really curing them. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. It's been a real honor to be here, and I appreciate the invitation.